For many, the world of import games is one of great mystique. Even for veteran collectors, hardcore gamers, or longtime video game enthusiasts, it can feel like a vastly unexplored ocean of games that can be rather daunting to get into without a proper guide or understanding of the language. Which is a shame, as there's an endless amount of joy to be had from games that never cross the pond. Which is why I've created this beginner's guide to Super Famicom games, to give you a good place to dip your toes in and hopefully start your collection. But before we dive into the games themselves, let's talk console modding. But if you're an eager beaver who's saying, oh shut up and get to the games already, then here's your time code. First and foremost, you gotta be able to play the games once you get them. And thankfully, the only thing keeping you from some Sufami goodness are these two plastic tabs inside your Super NES. They can easily be plucked out with a pair of needle nose pliers or something of the like. Do be warned, it will leave your card sitting a little loose. So if you don't want to perform surgery on your SNES, then a Super Game Genie or a converter are good alternatives to bypass the region lock. If you're looking for a more modern solution, might I direct you to any of Hyperkin's consoles as they'll do the trick and feature some handy tools that we'll touch upon later. Or you can grab Analog Super NT if you want to go the boutique route. Alright, you got the console, but of course, now you need some games. First off, how about a few cheap titles? For me, this equates to anything under $35, cart only. And right off the bat, we have two games that fit the bill. These two beat-em-ups based on Sailor Moon are exactly what you'd expect. Serviceable brawlers with a bright and frilly Sailor Moon coat of paint. In both games, the five inner senshi are at your disposal to run the gambit on Queen Barrel's minions through a barrage of quaint levels. Although, they do sometimes venture off into some rather psychedelic territories. Good lord, I'm in like H.R. Geiger's house. Beyond that, the Sailor Scouts all possess a typical moveset of punches, kicks, and throws. Nonetheless, the addition of a chargeable special, unique to each scout, and a panic move best used when surrounded, does at least vary the gameplay. The sequel even adds a screen clearing super for some extra flair. Speaking of Sailor Moon R, while it may be the shorter game, clocking in at only 4 stages, they're at least a decent length, look better, and boast a deadlier set of foes. Not to mention the addition of Chibiusa mode where you can cruise through the game with everyone's favorite peanut, peanut, and a battle mode which is more or less a test run for the future Sailor Moon fighting games on the SNES. Regardless, you can't go wrong with either game as they're both fun, fairly cheap, and sport an enjoyable two-player mode making them well worth your time. If Sailor Moon didn't quite fill that 90s anime nostalgia void, the Knights just giving the three Dragon Ball Z Super Butoden games a shot, as they're all fairly unique, yet competent fighters that, for the era, accurately capture the feel of a DBZ episode, with the crazy split-screen fights and story mode that I'm told closely follows the show. Plus, they're all dirt cheap, so you might as well grab them. By the way, here's a quick tip for newcomers. If you're ever unsure about a game's title because it appears in all Japanese, like say, uh, Daikaiju Monogatari here, then simply search Google for the SHVC code found on every cart, as the mad lads at GameSpot were crazy enough to catalog them all for your convenience. Our next tier of games encompasses the $35 to $60 range. While not the cheapest, they're at least still affordable, so here's some good suggestions. The first entry in Konami's befuddling cult classic shoot-em-up series, Parodius Da, does not disappoint, with its absolutely batshit crazy happenings that have made the series a staple for all import enthusiasts. Besides the all-out zaniness found within, like cat pirate battleships, deadly exotic dancers, and bathing octopi, the game plays like a charm taking the majority of its playstyle and power-up system from Konami's renowned Gradius series. As if it wasn't obvious enough. We love Gradius 1! Yeah, we can tell. While I may prefer the two sequels in this Super Famicom trilogy, I can't deny that this is an excellent shmup with little to no slowdown which is quite the feat for the SNES. 
So if you're looking for an English-friendly shoot-em-up to start your Super Famicom collection with, then Parodius and its two sequels are fine choices. Now it's time to venture into the pricey side of the library, with games going for $70 or above. However, despite the steep prices, many of these are worthy contenders for your collection. Here we have Hudson's Do Re Mi Fantasy, which is one of the more popular import games that even your average Joe retro gamer has probably heard of. But by just looking at the game, it's immediately recognizable as to why it's so beloved. The salient late-era SNES graphics that really showcase what the system could do, coupled with the benchmark platforming, varied level design, and multitude of mechanics that maintain a sense of progression and ability easily surpass that of most platformers of the era. Oh, and can I just say how darn cute this game is? Every cutscene, action, and reaction is brought to life with a cavalcade of character, like how Mylon reacts to falling on a bed of spikes, or how every key item seems to bonk him on the head, and it never stopped being funny. This game is best compared to Super Mario World as they share very similar gameplay and design, right down to the inclusion of haunted house levels that require switch hunting and keys. But does Super Mario World have dancing donuts? Yeah, I don't think so. And all of this comes from a sequel to Mylon's Secret Castle. Talk about a sequel done right. But with this type of notoriety comes a hefty price tag, ranging anywhere from $75 loose to upwards of $250 complete in box. However, fan translations and reproduction carts exist as a cheaper and English-friendly alternative. On the topic of platformers, lastly we have one of the finest on the SNES, GS Mikami, which is based on the anime of the same name. Spanning more than just some excellent platforming stages chock full of Castlevania and Ninja Gaiden-esque gameplay, this gem also features a welcomed variety of playstyles with an awesome shoot-em-up stage and an auto-scroller set on the back of a giant cat. Come on, you know you want to play it. Putting aside the spectacles, the gameplay is tight and responsive in the most satisfying way, with a small variety of smart and useful moves, a few specials, and a wonderful backlog of enemies based around episodes of the show. This all culminates in a well-paced, graphically stunning spooktacular like no other. And I can't forget to mention how incredible the jazz and rock-inspired soundtrack is, including an astounding rendition of the show's theme song, which you're listening to now. For a full in-depth review of this one, check out my video on it, as there's so much more to this game that I don't have time to explain here. Ghost Super Mikami has unfortunately climbed its way up to the $70 to $150 range over the last few years, but in my honest opinion, it's one of the few expensive games that is worth every penny. And before I wrap up, how about a quick RPG recommendation? Because RPGs were a hot commodity in Japan, most ended up with a large print. And since most of them don't hold any collector's value, as they need to be enjoyed in their native language, the majority of them are stupid cheap, even complete in box. But why recommend them if they're not English friendly? Well, despite the language barrier, many Super Famicom RPGs have thankfully been translated by the fans, leaving us with a hefty trove of long missed out treasure. And many of these gems just need to be played, like Bahamut Lagoon, which is an awesome dragon-raising tactical RPG by Square, dripping in gorgeous 16-bit graphical marvels and boasting a fine Squaresoft soundtrack. Plus, it just recently received a revised translation for all to enjoy. The icing on the cake is that a translated repro isn't needed if you have a Retron 5. One lovely feature of Hyperkin's emulation station is the ability to patch Japanese games in the box so long as the translation is provided. So extra points to Hyperkin for that awesome feature. Assuming that you're not already furiously searching eBay for these games, if I've convinced you to give these a try, or even piqued your interest in import games, and you want more, then be sure to give my cheap yet good imports video a watch or check out my channel for plenty of other Super Famicom reviews. But if that doesn't satisfy, then websites like superfamicom.org have the majority of the system's library cataloged and broken down by genre for ease of search. Plus, there's the always reliable method of searching eBay for Super Famicom games and seeing what pops up. 
Well, I hope this handy guide provided you with a good jumping off point into the wonderful world of import games. And with that, I wish you all happy hunting. Hey, thanks for watching. If you liked this episode, consider checking out these other videos right here, or even subscribing. Also, if you'd like to throw me a couple of bucks, you can support the show on Patreon.